Hello, so today we're gonna talk about sorcery. This is, didn't make it into my reading vlogs because I've, you know, I've just been reading a couple of heavy books lately, multiple heavy books at once, and one day I just told my Discord, I was like, you guys, I need a break. And so I paused all of the books that I was reading, which was three, that sounded dramatic. I paused them all and instead just spent the day reading this and it was the right choice. This is probably my least favorite Discworld book so far, but it was still the perfect use of my day. So Discworld is awesome. So, so far I've read three um, City Watch books. That was my introduction to Discworld. And then I went uh, back to the beginning and I've been reading them chronologically. And this is book five, possibly chronologically. That seems right. Yeah, book five chronologically. And so far of the arcs that I've read in, I've read The City Watch, I read one Mort book and one Witches book and three Rincewind books. And so far, Rincewind has been my least favorite arc in Discworld, even though I like Rincewind as a character well enough. So anyway, even with this being possibly my least favorite Discworld book so far, there's still a lot of good to talk about in it. So this will probably be a quick review because I don't have a ton to say about this book, but uh, I do have some to say. So let's talk about it. The book starts with death. Can do no wrong in that regard. So you probably know this. If you don't know, these are spoiler reviews. I've given a spoiler review for every Discworld book that I've read so far. There might be a playlist for you, and if there is, you know, you can find it. Um, but anyway, this starts, our, the, the plot of this in this spoiler review is an eighth son of an eighth son is a wizard. Well, what happens when that wizard has eight more sons? They become a sorcerer. We don't really like that when that happens because, you know, wars and big bad things because sorcerers are a big deal. I love the interactions with death. At the beginning, death is always a highlight to any Discworld book. I love when death is greeting um, the, what was his name? Ipslor. His name is Ipslor. Um, when, when he says, children are our hope for the future. There is no hope for the future, says death, or said death. What does it contain then? Me. Besides you, I mean. Death gave him a puzzled look. I'm sorry? The storm reached its howling peak overhead. A seagull went past backwards. I meant, said Ipslor bitterly, what is there in this world that makes living worthwhile? Death thought about it. Cats, he said eventually. Cats are nice. Curse you. Many have. <laughs> Death. Death said evenly. Just right from the jump, we have several really great death lines, which I could just read all of them to you if you wanted. If you just want a review of quotes, I'm your gal. I'm great at that. Um, but I also really like, especially after reading Mort, I really like th the role that death plays and his complicated, the complicated nature of his job. He's obviously a compassionate person and he just wants to shepherd people into a new life, but there's also obstacles that come. Like for instance, when Ispor is like, I'm gonna go I'll continue living. <laughs> I'm gonna continue my will by inserting myself into the staff. And then death is put into this position where he's like, all right, I can't destroy the staff. I can't reap the soul without also affecting coin, but then I'm affecting destiny. So I don't really have a choice. So he's, he's essentially usurped here. Um, and I like that complicated relationship because it would be so easy to just make death this immortal creature who can do anything, but he really does feel so human in that he's just doing his darndest with his job and he doesn't always know how to handle every situation. And I really love that about his character. A character that's introduced in the novel that I really like is the hat, <laughs> this magical hat uh, that predicts that the world is going to end. There's a, there's an apocalypse. There's uh, the, or I'm sorry, apocalypse. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Um, but you know, predicting the end of the world that the death of all wizardry is at hand and it's Rincewind's uh, task to get Hat from point A to point B, much to his chagrin, because he just would like a boring life, please. And he's teamed up with Koinita, um, Conan the Barbarian's daughter, who just, uh, what is it, a hairdresser? She just wants to be a hairdresser, but she has this legacy. She has this, it's like a family trade. She's gotta be a thief. I really like her character. I think she's a lot of fun. She feels very dry and, uh, 
uh, has this kind of straight man sort of personality to her. I, I enjoyed the reoccurring scenes of her uh, getting changed um, and telling Rincewind, all right, turn around, I gotta get changed. And so he turns around and then she comes back and she's dressed differently or, or he's like, okay, so how do we handle this situation? She's like, turn around. So he turns around and then he turns back around and she's got a knife out and he's like, that was just hidden on your person? She's like, yep. And he's like, well, I don't want to disarm you. She's like, ah, don't worry about it. I've got plenty more. <laughs> like, who knows what's hidden in her bodice, but she's definitely armed <laughs> to the teeth. And I love that about her. Another character that's introduced in this novel is Coin, obviously, the sorcerer. Um, I really, really loved this line when Carding uh, reaches out a hand to touch Coin's staff. And it says, it was a shocking breach of etiquette. It was a shocking breach of etiquette in any case. No wizard should even think of touching another staff without his express permission. But there were people who can't quite believe that children are fully human and think that the operation of normal good manners doesn't apply to them. I love these little drops of observation of human nature that Pratchett has in his books. Like this book, I wouldn't necessarily say that the treatment of children is one of the main themes of the book, unless I just missed that. Um, and yet he still just wants to comment on the behavior of individuals treating children as if they, you're not quite human. So I can, I can kind of break the rules of etiquette. I can do what I want. That's absolutely true coming from a mom. You know, people will get into kids' faces and break, they'll breach what's appropriate to how to interact with another human because they're like, ah, it's a child. I can do what I want, you know? And it's like, no, no, their boundaries are really important. Like they need to feel comfortable and you're not respecting basic understanding of human human comfortability. Um, I really like that, uh, that, that Pratchett just kind of drops these human observations in his books, even if they're not anchored in specifically to themes. But then I also love that the staff then bites him. <laughs> And then Coin tells him, next time you, you touch the staff, uh, he said matter-of-factly, you will die. Do you understand? I love Coin's character. And this is one of my few complaints that I can actually pin down. Coin was such an interesting character and being the character that the story is named after, I really would have liked to have more of Coin in the book. And it makes sense narratively why he's not, but I just would have liked to explore his character just a touch more. I also like this line after the staff biting. Don't touch his staff, muttered Carding. I'll remember, um, not to, said Spelter firmly. What did it feel like? Have you ever been bitten by a viper? No. In that case, you'll understand exactly what it felt like. Hmm? It wasn't like a snake bite at all. It's just, it's just nonsense. There wasn't near as much humor in this book that I really, I didn't feel like there was nearly as much humor in this Discworld book than others, but it's still, there was still some really good scenes. Like another really, I loved the scene with the snake pit where, um, <laughs> where Rincewind is thrown into the snake pit and they ask him, how do you feel about snakes? And he's like, uh, not great. And they were like, great, throw him in the snake pit. He's like, I feel great about snakes. And then the snake pit ended up being just a pit with one measly little snake in there. And that's where he meets the barbarian that is in the pit because he failed to do a heist they think it was because he had an asthma attack. Like, I just, I'm getting ahead of myself. But there were still some really, really good scenes. Another one that I really liked is when Rincewind is complaining that, uh, that he would like a boring life. It'd be really great if people would stop forcing adventures on him. He would like to just have a very boring, bland existence, but adventures keep finding him and he keeps put, getting put in these perilous situations. And the barbarian tells him, idiot, all you have to do is stop wearing that silly robe and get rid of that daft hat and no one will even know you're a wizard. Rincewind's mouth opened and shut a few times as he gave very, very lifelike impression of a goldfish trying to, to grasp the concept of tap dancing. Stop wearing the robe? So he, he realizes, or rather Nigel tells him, if you'll just quit wearing the robe and the hat, people will stop knowing you're a wizard. They'll stop asking you for stuff and you'll stop being put in these situations that you don't want to be put in. And he's like, but it's a good robe. It's a nice hat. I, why would I, I don't want to stop wearing them. So Nigel was a fun little addition too. I thought it was really cute that he uh, wanted to be a barbarian and he projected himself as a barbarian. But then as Rincewind got to know him a little bit better, he was like, but how long have you been a barbarian exactly? <laughs> I think it was, it was the scene where someone tried to harm them and Nigel was appalled that someone would try to harm them. And Rincewind's like, 
how long have you been a barbarian? And he goes, oh, three days. <laughs> and, and there was a scene where uh, he asked for directions and the lady gave him directions and then he just walked off. And, um, and Rincewind goes, you just asked for directions? You didn't demand it? You didn't like hold someone hostage for this information? And, and he just goes, well, you know, I didn't say thank you. So progress, <laughs> baby steps, I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> but like I said, I also like Rincewind simply because he's a different kind of protagonist being the unlikely or unwilling hero. Um, I like that he doesn't have some huge character arc over these three books. In the first two books, he doesn't really change hardly at all. And then by the third book, he's learned to spell and he's gained a little bit of knowledge, but he's still a slow learner. He's still not very apt at uh, using a sword or anything really. He's not a skilled fighter. He's not, he's still not impressive in any way. And he's still fearful and actively runs away from anything heroic. Yet, when he doesn't have a choice in the matter, no, that's incorrect. Yet, when he's faced with these dire situations, he does show up. Like, he does help Coin get his staff back. He does make sacrifices, even if it means that he might get left behind. He still is He's not a passive character. He's a very active character. He just isn't running into danger to be the hero of the story. And I like that because that's a different kind of a different kind of character to follow. And there's a lot of humor that comes with his timidity and with his reluctance to have an adventure and in fact his resistance to adventure, but he'll still rise to the occasion when he's forced to. So there's some elements to him that I really like as well. And I like his slow progress. A character like him should suddenly become heroic in the face of adverse, adversity. And the fact that he has little steps toward that heroicism, I think is a much more authentic character arc for him. So I think he's, I think he's, you know, he may not be my favorite protagonist in all of Discworld, but he's a different kind of protagonist, which is nice. There were topics like power, governance, madness, and revenge that were brought up in this story, um, but I think the theme that was presented that I enjoyed the most was that of um, parent, um, what's expected of you from your family line and choosing your own future. So we saw that in Koinita, the barbarian, uh, no, Sorry, we saw that in Koinita, the thief, um, the Conan's uh, daughter, that this is this is the family trade. This is what's expected of her, but she's really, she wants a pretty simple life. She wants a much more commonplace job, but she doesn't really have a choice because this is her heritage. Then we also see that in Coin, obviously, with his dad and with him uh, pursuing his father's vengeance. And he has to, he too has to question, okay, but is this the right path? And is this the right path for me? And I really like that um, that in this book in a couple different ways that sort of brought up this idea of of the will or the heritage or the desire that's passed on from a parent and your natural inclination to pick it up because that's what's expected of you but then you kind of have to have that moment that reflection of okay, but is this my path or is this was this just the path of my parent? So I enjoyed that in this book too. I really don't have a ton to say about sorcery. As I said, I think that as far as pacing and plotting, this is probably the... Mm, this is one of the better ones of the early books, but as far as just general enjoyment of what the story did, and the exploration of the themes that are brought up, I think that Mort and... Um, Equal Rights <laughs> were both stronger for me. It's hard to explain because I don't think that the plot of Equal Rights or Mar Mort were extraordinary. And in fact, I think sorcery was probably better executed. And just as far as like creating a lot of different um, lines of the plot and bringing them together and doing them in a really cohesive way, I do think that sorcery is better technically. I just enjoyed Equal Rights and Mort more. It's hard for me to pin down why. This was just one of the weaker ones for me, but I still had, there was still a lot to enjoy about it. So this is a three star where every other Pratchett book I've read so far has been a four or a five. So I still enjoyed it. I still, there's still plenty to talk about, just significantly less 
to talk about somehow. I still had a good time with it. I think that any Pratchett book so far has been a delight to read, even if it's been, it was chaotic, it was fun, it was goofy, there were some laughs. I don't have a lot to say about it, but hey, it was a good time. I have found that the Rincewind books have been the hardest for me to give a really solid review for. It's more of, here's some overall thoughts I had about the book, here's some things that I liked about it, but it's not a, it's, I feel like these reviews aren't as good. <laughs> And I, and I don't know why I have a harder time with the Rincewind books. Maybe just because I don't, I'm not as over the moon about them as I am at, with the other Discworld books, but they're still, they're still a good time. Like I've still, I had a great time spending my day reading sorcery. Anyway, what do you think about the book? How do you feel about it? Do you like it more than me? Do you like it less than me? Tell me why you liked it, what your favorite and least favorite parts of it were. I post videos every Tuesday and Thursday on this channel, Mondays and Fridays on the other channel, which is always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.